Hi, I'm Phil Haley, Public Access Coordinator for NORCAM. And uh, we're here to host a round table discussion uh, about question one. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the yes side of question one. Uh, Taylor Mayer from SafePatientLimits.org has sent a statement for me to read, and I'll read that in a moment. Uh, they regretfully couldn't make it. But we have, is it Kim Stevenson? Kim Stevenson from uh, No On One. Yes. And uh, what is your organization again? Um, so I'm the manager for clinical health data analysis and research at the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. Oh, lovely. Well, give me one second. I will just read over this statement uh, from Taylor Mayer from SafePatientLimits.org. Uh, so, <clears throat> official statement from uh, SafePatientLimits.org. The need to set a safe maximum limit on the number of patients assigned to a nurse at one time is a mean of concern in the Commonwealth. Patients are sicker. Nurse staffing levels are more dire. Nurses have too many patients to care for at one time, and there is an extreme detrimental effect on quality of care and on patient outcomes. Nurses have been advocating for safe patient limits for over 20 years and have little to no response from management. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, nurses from the Committee to Ensure Safe Patient Care presented to the public uh, thousands of official reports documenting instances where nurses were forced to take ex excessive patient assignments that, quote unquote, pose a serious threat to the safety and well-being of my patients, end quote. Each of these reports was shared with and signed by management representatives in real time. And in nearly every case management, in, and in nearly every case, management refused to alter the nurse's patient assignment or provide any relief to ensure appropriate care. Responses included, quote, do the best you can, end quote, or, quote, we have no one to send you, end quote. One manager responded by writing, quote, whatever. These are human lives. Hospitals right now are making choices about where to invest their money, whether it is in staffing and ensuring that their patients are cared for safely, or if they have decided to invest in buying other hospitals in other states, or even in other countries. It is a choice that is made by hospitals where they put their finances. The ongoing threats about program and service closures by Massachusetts hospital executives are the same fear-mongering tactics used by the opposition in California some 14 years ago, when safe patient limits were implemented there. The reality is that no hospitals, not a single one, closed as, as a result of safe patient limits. California healthcare costs and spending fall far below both the national and Massachusetts average, or averages. There has been overwhelming uh, support for a yes vote on question one, not just from nurses out knocking on doors every day, but also from people across the Commonwealth who know they may be patients themselves and want the best quality of care possible. And who and who know that uh, who knows that the safe patient limits proposed by question one are the right choice for and and who know that the safe patient limits proposed by question one are the right choice for safety All right, and that is um, the statement so I guess uh, I guess we can start with a response uh, to the statement Kim um, well we believe that this ballot would actually create harm to patient care um, and severely limit access to care um, so, as I'm just trying to recall all of the things that were just stated, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I want to address, I guess, these safe staffing forms first. Um, so, these are forms that uh, union nurses are encouraged to fill out and submit to the union, who I might add has no authority to do anything about it. Oh, okay. um, so, formal complaints go through the Department of Public Health, and it's up to the Department of Public Health to investigate any. Uh, claims of unsafe patient care um, and act accordingly um, and all I can say is that they have not had any reason to do so in the last year. Um, so it's interesting that these forms come out during contract negotiations and two weeks before the ballot uh, question vote um, and not, you know, if, there, if there's the really the big year, yeah. uh, concerns then why, why aren't they being reported to the authority that actually can do something about it. And they um, they will take these reports. Uh, was it the, was the uh, state group that deals with it? What were you saying? The Massachusetts Nurses Association. Yeah, is that what uh, who takes these complaints? Is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, so these are union forms. Um, they're developed by the Massachusetts Nurses Association, and their staff, um, their nurses at their union hospitals, um, are given them and encouraged to fill them out. Okay. Um, there are certainly some instances we've heard where hospitals 
Um, the nurse manager has not even been notified that there was one filled out. Oh. Um, and should they, the, the protocol to notify, like, once they're filled? They are supposed to discuss it with the hospitals in real time, and um, when management is told about it, they investigate the situation and um, decide accordingly, do they need to move staff around, um, do they need to call somebody in, um, what, you know, whatever needs to happen. Um, so that's yeah. kind of the, the protocol. But again, they go back to the MNA. They don't go to the Department of Public Health, which is actually the body that regulates um, any safety complaints. Okay, but through that they can make it, like, it can go to, through management and to the, mm -hmm. all right. Yep. So that's the protocol on the, that's just brought, okay, so that's brought up that's right there. That's from what I understand. Yeah, fair enough, no. I mean, I don't know, and mm -hmm. this, as a layman, it's, I'd like to know the process. So right. if someone tells me something that happens, if it contradicts something with the process or the protocol is supposed to be, then, you know, it's mm -hmm. good to get it out there. So yeah, I, I guess anything else or? Um, yes, yeah, so spending, um, I know that's come up a lot um, in the campaign. So let's just talk about the spending of this ballot. So the Health Policy yeah. Commission, which is an independent state agency, um, which the MA trusted enough to write them into the ballot to enforce, um, oversee the regulations, um, they came up with their own independent cost analysis um, with the help of a researcher from the University of California, Joanne Spetz. Um, and the reason I bring that up is California is the only other state in the country that has these ratios. And for over a decade, right? Uh, yes, I'll get oh, to we'll that. Oh, we'll get fair. <laughs> fair, fair, fair yes. Um, so their estimate was uh, about $676 million to $950 million per year as the cost. Um, but they state in their estimate that it's a conservative estimate. It does not include costs associated with um, in, in staffing increases in emergency departments, outpatient units, um, observation units, and other um, one-time costs like with the acuity tool and such. So what would those other, I mean, those are considerable additional costs. Yes, yes. Right. And probably, uh, do you have like, would that double or would that be a, um, like a third addition on top? Or I mean, is that too vague to? Um, we... Uh, no, I'm sorry. I know it's a, a number probably not fully crunched. I know that when... Um, the, there was a report that came out in April with a cost analysis um, that MHA commissioned, and uh, but it was an independent research study. They estimated the the statewide impact at 1.3 billion. Oh, just with everything in tow. Yeah. Oh wow. So I mean, it's it's likely that this cost will exceed a billion dollars. What the exact cost would be, we don't. Don't know until it happens. Right. And um, are there, these studies are online as well, I imagine. Yes, they are, um, and they're all publicly available. Um, so the Health Policy Commission study, I would encourage anyone um, still deciding on this question to review it. It's on the mass.gov website. Okay. Um, if you just search Health Policy Commission Nurse Staffing Report, um, it should come up. Oh, good. Um, and you can see their yep. findings. And it's not just the cost. They also estimated who uh, some potential unintended consequences, the same ones that we've been discussing about increased wait times in emergency departments, decreased access to care, yeah. um, community hospitals, particularly those that have high uh, public payer patients, so patients that are on Medicare and Medicaid, yeah. um, they're likely to be the hardest hit um, and also have the least means to be able to pay for the additional increases in staff. So the insurance companies themselves won't be able to keep, keep up with? So the way that hospital payments work is that um, hospitals can negotiate payment rates with private payers, so Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Pilgrim, et cetera. Um, you cannot negotiate payments with Medicare and Medicaid. Those are set by the government. Yeah. Um, so while other hospitals that might have a higher percentage of their patients that have Blue Cross or Harvard, Pilgrim, um, they can negotiate increases in those rates. But hospitals that have a higher mix of Medicare and Medicaid patients, so Boston Medical Center, for example, um, a lot of the community hospitals like out in Western Mass or South Shore, South Coast, um, they don't have that same leverage to be able to go and negotiate higher rates to help cover the cost of the additional nurses. Um, and those also tend to be hospitals where more nurses are needed um, because uh -huh. they don't have as much staffing as some of the Boston teaching hospitals, for example. Oh, because they um, all flock to them to kind of, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, so the Health Policy Commission said that those are likely to be the hardest hit, um, and that's what we're concerned about. Um, there, there's really two 
Well, there's there's several concerns, uh, no, no, <laughs> I no, suppose. Fair. As um, many as you can tackle, I guess. Yeah, so um, first of all, there aren't enough nurses in the state to be able to comply with these ratios and um, maintain current patient volume at all hospitals across the state. Mm -hmm. um, we would need to hire, hospitals would need to hire um, upwards of 5,000 or more nurses by January 1st. Um, mm -hmm. And even without that January 1st timeline, there just aren't 5,000 qualified nurses Ready who fit into all the right buckets. Oh, I see. Um, yes. Because, I mean, you can't take a psychiatric nurse and say, okay, go work in the ICU. Or, you, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing. Like, you're not going to go to your car cardiologist to get brain surgery. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? No, yeah, sure. I <laughs> so, mean, and you, I remember hearing you talk about this the other night at, mm -hmm. um, I believe, uh, Kitty's restaurant here in town. Yeah. That uh, the in, they're also the retirement rate you were saying about nurses retiring and just yes. won't have that the turnover, which I didn't know it goes into effect January 1st if it's yes. voted in. Yes. I mean, is that that's the definite like timeline they're looking for? So that's what the Massachusetts Nurses Association wrote into the ballot. Oh, um, wow. If you read that's the ballot. It's not a lot of time at all. No, it's not. <laughs> Um, if you read the ballot, which we encourage everybody to do, um, it spells out the different guidelines. So one of the things that they've been saying is that, oh, well, it's not actually going to go into effect on January 1st because there's all these regulations that have to be drafted and That's hospitals just have to of, submit a plan. But if you read the actual ballot, there's three key areas that say, make this not the case. Oh. Um, so there's Section 231B, which states that hospitals... Um, must come into compliance with the staffing while making their staffing plans. Oh, so, so in congruence with... It's, oh, concurrently wow. is the first word. Oh. So concurrently oh, with meeting the, the, oh, wow. the ratios um, Is there a, a buffer, like, as they're doing it, is it, if they can show that they're doing it, then they'll be able... Or is that kind of gray? So in Section two th uh, 231E, yeah. oh. Um, oh, yeah, yes, <laughs> which I encourage people to read, yeah. um, it states that the Health Policy Commission cannot offer any waivers, delays, oh. anything to this ballot. It has to be enacted as is. Under any circumstances, they can't delay it or offer yeah. waivers or anything. And then the last line, Section 3, is that it goes into effect on January 1st, 2019. And at the Health Policy Commission cost trends hearing, which um, the MA was present at and brought this timeline up, Mm. Um, that it wouldn't necessarily go into effect on January 1st. Uh, the Health Policy Commission had their legal counsel right there at the meeting um, give a statement on that, and um, their legal counsel said it goes into effect January 1st. And the, the people who are implementing this are their counsel, just to yes. reiterate, so yes. this would indeed go into It's stated wow. to go into effect on January 1st. Wow. So if the MA. Sorry for repeating. It's more or less for mine. Yeah, interest, no, that's, but no, that's that is this wow. is the enforcer no, or no. legal counsel saying January first. It's almost like they're um, what is it? The kill switch is that what they call it in a, in a law? Like it's like a kill switch kind of or I it, think something like maybe. or it just it might not be the exact same thing, but it seems like they're also just kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Even if they want this pass, it seems like a big like blockage to that sort of thing. There is a lot of flaws in the ballot, which is what we're concerned about. Um, mm. The rigidity of it and not allowing waivers for hospitals. So to go back to California, let me just give a brief sure, background yeah. on California. So that was not done through ballot. Um, that was done through the legislature in 1999. They passed a law. Um, and in 1999, the law that they passed was that they would come up with these ratios um, in some sort of system, but it was not in place in 1999. They actually mm. hadn't even identified what those targets would be. So it was very exploratory, mm. like we're going to go, f we're going to do this. We're going to test it out. But anyway. um, so the, they did some studies, um, and the ratios did not actually go into effect until 2004. So they had five years to prepare for this. Mm. Um, and even then, it was a phased in approach. The final ratios didn't go into effect until 2008. There were some units that they mm. kind of staggered. Um, decreasing them. And even then, I mean, I imagine they hit um, a lot of snags along the way. Yeah. So they took almost 10 years to fully implement everything, really, from 99 to 2008? Yeah, from when it was signed, yeah, through yeah. 2008. Um, and there were consequences there. And so one other, a couple key differences, there's a few key differences of why this is not the same thing that California did. Yeah. Um, so California allows waivers for rural and small hospitals. And so what, the, what would that waiver do? Just um, I believe it would allow them, it, they, ha they 
strive to meet the ratios, yeah. but I don't think that they're penalized or anything. Oh, so um, free of any sort of oh, penalty, Yeah, of right. any sort of consequence if they're not able to meet them. Um, I'm not as well versed in those waivers. I just yeah. know that um, there's at least 23 hospitals that were granted um, such waivers. Okay. Um, some other differences, they allow the ratios to be met by LPNs or licensed practical nurses and registered nurses, hmm. um, up to 50-50 mix. Um, the MNA's ballot requires it just to be met by registered nurses exclusively. Oh, so you can't, it's, so, and please explain the difference between a registered nurse and, mm -hmm. and an LPN. And so an they LPN, have sorry. more training. Um, so uh, registered nurses are great and we want the more skilled, more experienced and more educated nurses to be caring for patients. Um, LPN is also, they provide a great support role. They have a different scope of practice. Okay. Um, so registered nurses can do a lot more. They just, it's a little bit more training um, than a licensed nurse. Kind of, uh, I mean, if I were to make the analogy to a, a para, to a teacher, kind of that kind of, um, I don't know how familiar that, you are with. Yeah, no, that might be a fair comparison. I'm not exactly sure, but sure. that oh, could right. be. Yeah. Um, but along those lines of just yes. uh, more training in one particular area or all around as yeah. opposed to a general yes. kind of training? Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the ratios themselves in California are also different than those being proposed by the m and um, mm -hmm. So for example, in medical surgical units, which is the most common type of unit that patients are in, um, in California there is one nurse to five patients, whereas in the m and it's one nurse to four patients. Mm -hmm. So right there, we're, we, need, we need more registered nurses to meet the ratios because it has to be met by 100% ah, RNs. Ah, not 50, 50. And then one, you need yeah. more because there's stricter requirements for um, how many patients a nurse can care for. Oh, on top of that. So what, of what are the caps for how many uh, patients a nurse, with the new law, it would be a cap on how many yeah. patients? Yeah, so it varies by unit, but every hospital is expected to comply with all of those ratios, from yeah. your large academic medical hospitals to your small community hospitals. They're all, they all would have the same standards. Yeah. Um, which on the surface sounds great, but if you dig into it and see the types of patients that are cared for in these different centers, you, the academic medical centers tend to have sicker patients, more complex cases yeah. um, than the community hospitals because the community hospitals are great and they serve a terrific purpose to have care close to home. Um, but if you are very seriously ill, um, you're going to be shipped to an academic medical center that has more of the specialized training, um, the facilities, technology, etc. Sure, yeah. Um, More city-based kind of, yeah. Right. So your care needs are not necessarily the same at both types of hospitals. Um, to get back to the ratios, uh, the emergency department is actually one of the ones that we're the most concerned about. There's four different ratios proposed for the emergency department depending on the condition of a patient. So it's mm -hmm. one to one, one to two, one to three, or one to five. Oh. nurse to patients. And it depended on what uh, level of care right. or whatever? Yes, depending on the level of care that is deemed required by each patient. Oh. Um, but you can imagine, if you've ever been in an emergency department, patient conditions change minute to minute. Um, yeah. Just because you're stable now doesn't mean you're going to be stable 10 minutes from now, depending yeah, on seconds or minutes. if you're yeah. coming in with you know, chest pain. Um, and they give you something they don't know you're allergic to or something happens. Uh, anything and, you know, can happen yeah. in an emergency department. So we're concerned that nurses and other care team members are going to be more concerned with having to, am I going over ratio, am I going over yeah. ratio rather than provide patient care. Were they going to hire someone to overlook or is it, is it something where they're like, oh, now the hospital will have to hire a more middle management to overlook that or is it I don't know what unclear? that will look like exactly. Um, so there is an acuity tool that's a part of this so they can kind of gauge patient care needs. But again, yeah. Um, these ratios would be in effect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So um, there would wow. be no change in staffing levels from noon to midnight, 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. when patients are sleeping. Yeah. Um, you would still have to have maintain the same level of staffing. Oh, so it, like, oh wow. Yeah. So okay, that's just kind of a constant blanket. Kind yes, right. yes, where most well, hospitals... Well, here's the rigidity you speak of, I guess. Yes, yeah. so most hospitals tend to decrease a little bit of staffing in the evening and overnight when you're not doing testing and procedures, and mm. a lot of patients, especially if they're stable, are generally sleeping. Like, yes, patients need care overnight, some patients do, mm. um, but you kind of tailor your staffing to 
what's on your unit at the time and what their needs are at the time, as opposed to just this rigid one size fits all, 24 hours a day thing. Um, and the penalty for breaking the ratios is up to $25,000 per incident per day. Oh. It's a penalty well, to the hospital. Yeah, that's not, I mean, I guess my uh, comment on that would be if someone were to, and I, and I don't think, uh, it, it sounds like a pretty hefty fine on its own, but also like, how many people will report each and every little one? I mean, that, I don't and how know. do you enforce? What's the enforcement? Is that, is that very clear as to who? Um, so the Health what? Policy Commission is um, written into the ballot to oversee it, and then I believe any complaints that they get are sent on to the Attorney General, and then there's this so there's, process. Yeah, so there's the pro. Okay, so there's a process. The bureaucracy of yeah. getting it done would be another staffing right. issue, but I imagine. Right, the HPC too. is required by the ballot to um, pass on any um, complaints hmm. that come in um, to, to uh, the Attorney General. So in theory, weirdly enough, this might be something where people, I mean, just like anything else, the lower de facto, you know, the law, what is the fact, mm -hmm. like you could violate some things and if people didn't report it, you, you know, that can only go on for so long, possibly, I imagine, where people wouldn't report it to, but I guess this is yeah. where we would I say mean, if we, we were in there. Yeah, it was that's passed. one of the things that we don't know. Will every single incident get reported? Mm. Will some not get reported? We don't, I don't know. Oh, we're, it's just a very heady... Um, this is about this question that gets me. It's just there's a lot of things, working parts, yeah. logistically, and working in video right. and film, you find that you have to try to control almost everything. Right. And just the logistics of all of it just seem mind-boggling. Because yeah. it seems like there would be such, because there's a commission, so uh, uh, I apologize. If I, Health I can't, Policy Commission. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> HPC, right? HPC. Uh, if they will set up another group, or no, their current staffing will handle all the stuff. Oh, so <laughs> they... <laughs> <laughs> the they say it all. No, they would have to figure out what um, staffing, who's going to oversee that, to people. and who's going to pay for that too, because yeah, yeah. that's another cost. Well, that's state. that's what we'll say too. Um, uh, well, that's a, that's, that's also a separate. separate issue. Yeah, no, yeah, but that's separate from yes. like the actual hospitals yeah. having to do it. And that's actually yeah. the complaint I've I've seen um, and heard from people that this is a man this is a management versus union thing. Which I can, I can see the um, kind of allusion to it. Yeah. But, um, I mean, there's got to be a point where even the, the nurses' union, I think you said this the other night. I don't know if you want to touch on that. What do the nurses' union say about, mm -hmm. or the many nurses' unions yes. say about this bill? So there are eight professional nursing organizations representing Massachusetts nurses mm -hmm. that are opposed to this ballot. Okay. Um, and WBUR did a poll a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it publicly available. It was reported on mm -hmm. the story. Um, 33% of the MNA nurses who are polled oppose this ballot. Oh, wow. Um, so that's 33% of the nurses of the group that put this ballot forward oppose yeah. it. Um, this is not strictly a bedside nurse versus management nurse um, issue. Um, we just had a rally at the State House this morning, and um, I don't know the official count, but I think that there were probably at least 100 nurses there yeah. um, opposing this. Um, this is not widely supported. Less than half of the nurses in the state who've been polled support this. Um, well, so what, they, I they, guess, what is the drive? I mean, is there a real need for this? So, I mean, on some level, do you think there's some need for um, some sort of kind of switching things around or? Yeah, so I, we hear from nurses, um, some of them, not, not every nurse, this is not the experience of every nurse in every hospital, but some yeah. nurses in some units and some hospitals um, that do feel like they need more help, more staffing. Um, and we agree with that. There's 1,200 vacancies in hospitals right now um, are in positions that they're actively trying to fill. Yeah. Um, so yes, we, we recognize that we need to have more nurses and hospitals are trying to hire them. They don't exist. Yeah. Um, and one of the concerns that we have is that nurses, because there's a set number of nurses right now, I mean, there's just, you know, the supply, um, that we're worried that RNs will be pulled from home health care, from community health centers, oh. doctors, offices, um, school nurses will be pulled into the hospitals um, to meet these ratios. So there's only two ways to comply with the ratios. You either have to bring your staffing levels up or you decrease your patients, your, the number of patients that you see. That's it. Oh, Those wow. are the only two ways to meet the ratios under, under and not the get fined. New bill, yeah. um, so if a hospital is not able to hire enough nurses to 
maintain their current demand, either because they can't find the nurses or they can't pay for them, they can't afford it, mm -hmm. um, their only option is going to be to decrease the number of patients that they see. I mean, it's, it's math. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it, if you can do, you know, yeah, yeah, if you have the numbers, you can't do it. Right. Well, um, so, I mean, are there talks of trying to lure other nur nurses from New England or around, like... What we need to focus on is um, increasing the pipeline of nurses. And what I mean by that is um, right now, Massachusetts is home to some of the oldest nurse nurses in the country. And they're terrific nurses and they're mm. very experienced, um, but they are aging and they will be retiring. So 50% of our nurses are over 50 years old. Oh, so they're like, say you have a 15, 10 to 15 year window, is that, would that be accurate or even less? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that's fairly reasonable and 25% of nurses are over 60. Oh, okay. um, so I mean, we have over the next decade or so, there's gonna be a massive wave of mm. retirements. We lose about 4,500 nurses a year and we only graduate about 3,500. Oh. So right there, that's not accounting for ratios. Yeah. Well, and also graduation, that doesn't actually um, guarantee that they'll be in state. Right. Too. So right. That's Some nurses will leave the state um, and not every nurse goes to work in a hospital. As I yeah. said, there's oh, school care. nurses, yeah. there's home care, there's physician offices. Um, there's all, you know, long term nursing facilities. There's sure. all these different um, places of employment for nurses. Um, nurse educators, we need more of. Yeah. Um, there should be an effort on recruiting more nurse educators. And um, that would help to increase the class sizes. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, I know that there's qualified applicants to nursing schools who are turned away because they don't have enough nursing faculty to grow their class sizes. Oh. Um, so if we can shift a focus on that, and I'm not sure what that would look like exactly, but... And where do you begin with that? You just try to work with state uh, colleges and then other institutions and try to make Yeah, I'm not push? sure what that would look like, no. um, but I imagine there are experts in the field who could sure, yeah. put some, you know, some policy or proposals in place. Yeah. Um, but as I said, we have 1,200 vacancies across the state, so we need to focus on being able to fill those vacancies and perhaps nurses won't feel quite so taxed. Yeah. Um, so I, to, and to give kind of real context to this decreased access to care, um, Boston Medical Center, for example, um, they are one of the biggest trauma centers in New England, um, if not the biggest, they might mm -hmm. actually be the biggest. Um, and they also treat um, a very vulnerable population, um, very high public payer population, mm -hmm. Medicaid, Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, and they, if they were not able to uh, hire enough nurses that they would need, and I think what I heard is that they would need about 200 nurses to hire. If the bill would pass. If the bill yeah. passes. Um, they would have to see about 100 fewer emergency department patients per day, mm. every day. Um, they would see 800 fewer mothers a year to deliver babies. Um, and they would have to close a significant portion of their medical surgical beds. Just by the numbers. Just by the numbers. Mm -hmm. Because again, a nurse with this ballot can only care for a set number of patients, no matter if you could have patients that are ready to be discharged and they're just waiting for their ride or mm -hmm. you know, they're gonna be transferred to another unit or whatever have you, um, but it doesn't matter. If you have those patients assigned to you, you cannot take another patient, even if otherwise, you know, acuity-wise, you feel like I could. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are real consequences. Well, and also, the, the on topic and not to go down uh, another road too crazily but this is uh, about places closing like home care and hosp uh, general hospitals and uh, elderly communities closing because mm -hmm. i actually we recently uh worked with uh, the senior resource council in massachusetts i don't know if you're familiar with them i'm not the, personally oh fair enough the src a great organization and they held four different talks about you know how to deal with either your own, uh, deal with uh, people you know who are entering a certain stage of their life or, or, you know, personally if you're entering that stage. And one of them was home care. Mm -hmm. another, uh, another aspect was trying to find a, you know, a hospice, you know, or a center where, and hospice would fall under this too, right? Pretty much where, in, in a way, Any or? facility under a hospital license. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, their places are, are, are actually losing money and turning, having to turn people yes. away and 
Yes. Uh, kind of shut down. There was I, a couple that they mentioned. I apologize. I don't know the name mm -hmm. right off the bat, but uh, I, re I, I recognized and saw that as a real problem. They didn't bring up the, the ballot. This was actually a month ago, okay. uh, but they didn't bring up the ballot then as, as mm -hmm. kind of a thing because I don't think it would as strongly focus. Yeah. But uh, it, it seems to me that it is a problem that could hit uh, a heavier water, you know, hit that watermark. That, it could. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the M&A goes on, oh, no hospital closed in California. Nothing bad happened in California. Yeah. Well, that's oh, what just is, not true. Well, what, yeah, what is, <laughs> no, what is the response? Because this is the state that actually went through yeah. this. So um, there's a lot of research on California, a lot mm -hmm. of studies. Um, I've read them all. Um, and many of them mm -hmm. are actually available in PDF. Uh, if you go to Google Scholar and type in California nurse Google staffing Scholar. ratios, you can likely find a lot of them in full text. Oh, is there any uh, particular study that, oh, I'm sure mm -hmm. you're gonna go into it? All right. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I wanna say that there have been no systematic improvements in patient outcomes in California mm -hmm. as a result of ratios. Um, in fact, Massachusetts beats California on almost every quality measure um, across the board. According to the... Uh, uh, according to several organizations. Yeah. Um, Commonwealth Fund is one. Um, they rank Massachusetts at number two and California at number 14 for overall health care. Okay. Um, and that's publicly available. All these sources I'm about to talk about no, are no, all no, publicly it, available. I want uh, people to be able yeah, to read so whatever is out there. <laughs> Google Commonwealth Fund. Mm. Um, also, uh, LeapFrog does hospital safety grades and um, they grade every hospital from an A to an F. Um, Massachusetts as a state is ranked fourth in California is ranked 25th for safety. Um, Massachusetts has no hospitals that receive a D or an F grade, mm -hmm. um, which are the worst. Um, and California has several. Mm -hmm. um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, they also do state rankings. Massachusetts is number fourth and California is 42nd. Oh, wow. So I mean, all these different organizations, they look at different things, that's how you're getting different numbers, but mm -hmm. the consistency is Massachusetts is at the top, California's in the middle or the bottom. And, um, and if ratios are really the answer, why isn't California leading the pack? Sure, and what were they before um, the ratios? And that's another... Well, so there's been several studies that have looked at um, patient outcomes before and after implementation of the ratios to gauge mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, it's always hard in real life to isolate every um, factor that could Many variables, relate, so, yeah, a lot sure. of different variables. But um, there's been no consistent findings in, of improvement. Um, so one study, uh, Cook, uh, blanking on his first name, yeah. um, but he, it's a 2012 study, um, he looked at uh, failure to rescue rates and pressure ulcers. Yeah. Um, failure to rescue is when somebody a patient um, has some type of complication and then dies as a result of it. Oh. Um, so failure to rescue rates over the time period studied decreased generally across the state, but in California, in California, yeah. but they did not find evidence to tie it to the ratios. So, mm. for example, where staffing increases were the greatest, and where they were expecting to see the greatest drop. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't correspond, and so their conclusion is actually that they don't find any persuasive evidence that the ratios. Oh, interesting. It had any coincidentally? Impact. It just. It was just there were other ongoing initiatives happening over the same time period. Yeah. It's likely that the results were because of those other quality initiatives and not the ratios themselves. And who knows if those initiatives were a, a reaction to um, uh, implementing uh, the ratios or whatnot? Well, there's a lot of quality work. Um, I think people don't realize there's always quality improvement initiatives. Um, mm. There's national, local organizations, some hospitals do their own quality improvement work. Um, especially nowadays, I don't want to get too technical. No, no, I mean, um, I don't but, know and other viewers wouldn't know, so I mean, it's all news, you know what I mean? Yeah, so hospitals have a financial and reputational incentive to provide the best patient care possible. Um, and what I mean by that is um, there's a shift away from fee-for-service where you get paid for every tests and procedure that you do on a patient okay. to um, what we call quality-based payments. Um, and that's where um, hospitals can lose money uh, if they have uh, too many infections oh, okay. or too many bad patient safety Is issues. It, does that put pressure on the institution to like both good and bad ways to kind of... Yeah, well it, it, it financially incentivizes hospitals to provide the best Okay, care yeah. that they can because if they're going to lose money because sure. they have too many 
in fact, know, yeah, infections or what have infections you. Yeah. Or something, they're gonna, you know, step up their game. So there's yeah. a lot of quality and improvement initiatives ongoing across the country. Um, and also the number of nurses in hospitals is increasing. So for in Massachusetts, for example, um, we've seen a 31% a, um, increase in the number of RNs in hospitals um, between 2002 and 2016. So this notion that the MNA has been fighting this for 20 years and nothing has happened, yeah. we, that's, that translates to about 11,000 full-time RNs um, in that 14 year period. That's, a lot of our ends. Yeah, and me. yearly, it's you were saying like 3,500 yearly graduating. Yeah, so this is just th that's the net increase. That's so net that's R, taking yeah. into account both the new people and people cycling out. Oh, okay. So there's an 11,000 RN increase over that 14 Google. year period. Oh, that's not a bad, yeah. Um, and that's you know, barrel of labor statistics data. Yeah. Um, so we're not <laughs> just making no, that just up. Numbers just, fine. yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so uh, no, so no, I no, where I was no, it's all right. We're no, you were going pretty much California yes. and Massachusetts. Yeah. Oh, California, they haven't necessarily come out looking better. No, and actually, that was one of the Health Policy Commission's conclusions in their study. Um, again, they had Joanne Spetz, who's done more research on California than anybody else, yeah. um, and her conclusion was, I think, verbatim, there were no systematic improvements in patient outcomes following the ratios. Mm. Um, so that's that's in their public re available report. And she mentioned just like this uh, this didn't officially help, and just other factors right. also. Right. So it, the bottom line is, if there's no evidence to support that implementing these ratios is going to do anything, yeah. and it's going to cost over a billion dollars a year to implement, and we don't have the nurses to meet these ratios, which means you're going to have decreased access to care. Why are we doing this? Well, did California have the resource, like the, the nurses ready to go too? No, they were in a severe shortage. Um, they, uh, we, we've heard reports that they had a lot of nurses come in from out of state, from out of the country yeah. um, on a temporary basis. Um, is that something we'd imagine? I imagine that's something they try to do here. If this we would. I, I don't think hospitals would have much of a choice. They would have yeah. to. But the, the problem is that it, it's treating all nurses the same. A nurse is a nurse is a nurse. Yeah. Um, we know that's not true. I mean, that's do you perfect. really want somebody who can't get hired somewhere else to come into Massachusetts and be taking care of your mother? Well, even that, um, just your <laughs> well, even from that angle, like you're taking away from another state. You're just yes. prolonging a yeah. kind of problem that, right. like you said, it kind of stems with more people need to become there, like the profession needs to right. grow. Right, right. So uh, we feel that's where efforts should be focused on is kind of growing that. Um, you know, is nurse burnout real? Yes, yeah. just like physician burnout is real. Oh, it's a um, crazy jump. But there are other things to address that, and we want patients to be able to have access to great care. Massachusetts has some of the best hospitals in the country. Um, it, people come from all over the country, all over the world to get treatment here. So, yeah. no, I mean, and that's, <laughs> no, it's 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 uh, it's a weird picture. It, this whole thing is just um, it, it's very interesting, intriguing to me because mm -hmm. it seems like I always find it like there's always that everyone kind of wants the same. No one doesn't want the same thing. I find I think it's a matter of though they'll stick to some sort of rhetoric that they feel is. Um, they need until it's that last moment, like, oh, no, wait, we all want more nurses here. Right. We just, we're going about it the wrong, two separate ways, yes. which we don't agree uh, financially or statistically or what have you, that we'll be able to, you know, realistically and not just uh, quantitatively, but qualitatively mm -hmm. make it happen. So, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, this is a rough one, but this, all this information is golden. And I don't know if you had any uh, last, uh, uh, anything else you wanted to say. Yeah, um, well, you know, in medicine, um, we promote evidence-based practice. Um, that's, that's how medicine grows as a field for physicians, for nurses, for quality improvement, everything. Um, and there's just no evidence to support mandating uh, ratios. And in fact, there's research to the contrary sure. that this actually harms patients. Um, there are, as I mentioned, eight professional nursing organizations representing Massachusetts nurses who are opposed to this. There are more than 90 other healthcare uh, organizations from physician groups to community health centers, um, home health care, behavioral health, et cetera, that are opposed to this. And every single hospital in the state is opposed to this. 
Um, yeah. Why aren't we trusting the providers, the ones who are actually providing patient care? Uh, we, we should be. We should be asking them. And they've already spoken that they're, this is not going to improve patient care and um, is more likely to harm patients from lack of access um, to treatment. Well, Kim, thank you for coming in. Kim Stevenson. And what was your organization again? Uh, Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. And you can find uh, more about that organization in the U.S.? Um, yeah, and our website is protectpatientsafety.org. Um, so we encourage uh, people to go. We're constantly putting up new information there. Good, thank you. And uh, we'll try to provide links to everything you've uh, talked about, at least uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the major ones you've sure. referred to. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for coming in. And, thank uh, you for having me. No worries. And good luck uh, talking about this, and thank you for talking to us about it. And be sure to vote on November 6th. Go vote find your no polling. on one. <laughs> find your polling station. And uh, yeah, read up more and make your own uh, educated uh, decision. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you.